The years after the clan invasion saw the flourishing of innovation throughout the inner sphere, no matter the great house. The true to industrial powers of the inner sphere, however, with the largest means of producing new battle mechs in the post invasion era, were the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth. Despite the bruises and broken bones it had received from Clan Jade Falcon and Clan Steel Viper, as well as the Free Worlds League. In Technical Readout 3055, there is a massive groundswell of not only new battle mech chassis, but a new approach in how to adapt what technologies were available to create wholly new roles for battle mechs that had either been lost to the Inner Sphere with the fall of the Star League, or were entirely new roles that had never been seen before. The mech being covered in this video is a wild evolution of a single weapon focused machine, combining it with every possible advantage to create a sniper or a long range support platform, which at the time of its introduction would be a revolution in mech design. Coventry Mechworks would be the organization that conceptualized and built the ultimate one-hit wonder, the Hollander. A light mech weighing in at 35 tons, the Hollander would be manufactured on the world of Coventry, by Coventry Metalworks no less, in response to the clan invasion. One of the great problems that the Inner Sphere had faced at every step of the invasion was in the realm of weapon systems. To be frank, clan weapons not only weigh less, and often do dramatically more damage, but they also have a tendency to go further, or have no minimum ranges as compared to their Inner Sphere counterparts. A clan PPC weighs one ton less, does five damage more, and goes the same range, for instance as an Inner Sphere ERPPC. At long ranges, these shortcomings are made ever more evident. But there is one long distance, utterly devastating offensive tool that the Inner Sphere had access to, that while not being on parity with its clan counterpart, was close enough in every other respect to make this system the go-to choice for many mech designs. But particularly this was usually reserved for heavier mechs. This is the Gauss Rifle, which weighs in at 15 tons from the Inner Sphere. While yes, its clan counterpart is 12 tons, this is the only meaningful difference between the two. For the Inner Sphere, this is an enormous boon compared to its other options. When the Hollander was being proposed, Liren designers and engineers at Coventry faced this dilemma, and came to the same conclusion that many other manufacturers would in the mid to late 3050s which was the best way for the Inner Sphere to even the playing field with its invading counterparts, was to invest in Gauss weaponry, where and when possible. From the start, this light mech was built to be a mobile gun platform, which was meant to engage and annihilate light and medium clan forces in support of other Inner Sphere lighter assets, by delivering crippling or killing blows even to enemy battle mechs. To achieve this, it is the first Inner Sphere light mech ever to be built and armed with a full-size Inner Sphere Ghost Rifle. There is no other purpose for this mech's existence, beyond being a Gauss Rifle. But even then, even with this explicit purpose in mind, the Hollander faced major issues in its troubleshooting process. The biggest problem of all came in the form of not being able to match the original specifications called for in its development. The Hollander was envisioned as starting with significantly more armored plating, almost 50% more than it would eventually be delivered with. The problem was, as the first test builds were put together, engineers would discover that the mech not only was sluggish, and not just lacking in agility, but it would have trouble operating and moving. This didn't even begin to address that the BZK series were meant to have some ability to move at least at a moderately paced speed. Worse still, the Gauss Rifle would have trouble keeping on target in this configuration too. Rather than being burdened with a mech which was increasingly resembling an urban mech than the mobile gun platform Coventry had originally wanted, the decision was made to reduce its armored protection as yet another compromise in the configuration of the battle mech, in order to give it the full functionality of the original promise the machine was meant to deliver. Much to the relief of the engineers at Coventry, 
the solution worked, and the Hollander prototypes were able to target and track their targets with the ease they'd always intended, making it one of the most dangerous inner-shear light support mechs of its era. This change would result in the Hollander entering production by 3054 as the BZK-F3. And from there, the inner sphere and war, I would argue, would never be the same again. A mech so successful that five years later the clans would in essence mimic it for themselves, regardless of whatever they may say otherwise, with the ever-dangerous Pack Hunter. One of the most noteworthy things about the Hollander as well is unlike its clan knockoff, it has one of the most crucial things in common with the much derided urban mech, and that also flies in the face of typical Lyrum procurements and manufacturing. That is, the Hollander was built to be exceptionally affordable for what it is. It has no XL engine, and only endo steel and ferro fibers as truly advanced technologies outside of its Gauss rifle. The chassis, in other words, is inexpensive, and this means that the Federated Commonwealth's forces, as well as mercenaries, would buy large volumes of these battle mechs to face off against their clan counterparts, much to the horror of their enemies. Hollanders are never intended to be alone, in essence. They are always deployed with a lance, just like almost every other battle mech. When large formations use significant numbers of these relatively quick platforms for their armaments, it could spell doom for clan stars or other formations which find themselves being hunted by these repositioning monsters, while they attempt to engage more serious forces. No contact with the armed forces of the Federated Commonwealth, or even forces like the legendary Northwind Highlanders, could be taken for granted to not have these unkind devils lurking in the background for their clan opposition to feel its sound barrier breaking fury. The Hollander wasn't without faults, of course, but it was good enough. It is easy to build in large numbers. It is exceptional at delivering deadly attacks against their intended targets. And it's not too expensive as to avoid risking it in combat. The Hollander was the perfect hard counter to clan battle mechs, especially when deployed in numbers as mentioned before, and in support of combat formations and operations. Throughout its deployments during the clan invasion as well, it would be found that this cannon was just as effective at delivering death blows to clan heavy mechs too, making them even better dedicated mech killers than they were originally intended to be. The Hollander is one of the most significant contributions to not only the armies of the Inner Sphere during the clan invasion, but to manufacturing, design, tactics, and warfare's evolution during the clan invasion and beyond. It would evolve with time as well, earning several new variants as well as whole new upgrade models, namely in the form of the Hollander 2 and Hollander 3. Battle mechs don't often get sequels, unless the original delivers in a very real way. Most mech warriors on the other side of the Hollander pray it doesn't deliver a 125kg nickel iron slug directly to them. As a 35-ton light mech, the BZK-F3 Hollander, the first broad production model, is truly one of the best Learn products of its time and represents not only a machine which was effective at its job, but did so without breaking the bank, a true rarity amongst the Liren military industrial complex. This 3054 born nightmare will haunt the dreams of clan mech warriors, who have survived encounters with them, most certainly. To start with, it benefits from advanced technologies found within the Hell Memory Core, which help it save weight on internal structure and armor. This appears with it first benefiting from endo steel for said internal structure. Because there are no real alternatives at the time, it uses a standard gyro and cockpit as well. When it comes to its onboard electronics, it is served by reliable, but not spectacular systems. First, it has a Tharhas Muse 54-58K for its communications package. And then, for its targeting and tracking, it has a Cyclops 9 system. The communication system plays no role in any special abilities the Hollander may have in advanced rules, though it is possible that its Cyclops 9 targeting system could be tied to one of its quirks, at least in some distant way. 
the baseline quirks of the standard Hollander are unsurprisingly tied to its single system. First of all, it has the stabilized gun quirk for the Gauss rifle, which is terrifying. This means when it is being used in a game with advanced rules, this cannon will be able to be fired on the move with minimum penalties. Whether standing still or running, this gun will be on target. That is something to remember. It also has the reinforced legs quirk, though this does very little for the mech on the table. It has this rule to reflect the fact that the Hollander's legs are built explicitly to handle the massive recoil of the Gauss rifle, as well as to help the battle mech line up targets. Finally, it has the unbalanced trait, meaning that if the Hollander is caught in poor terrain conditions, or takes enough damage to force a piloting check, inexperienced pilots may find that their battle mech tumbles to the ground. In other words, mech warriors should avoid getting shot and try to avoid piloting skill rules when they are in this particular mech. Light mechs are often tied to movement, as it is something their lighter structures can do better than heavier mechs, all while doing it for less. For the Hollander, this is no different, but the battle mechs engineers had to measure several factors behind the engine decision they would make. First and foremost, the Hollander was meant to be an inexpensive platform when it was proposed, which basically excluded it from embracing the inner sphere's expensive and frankly flawed due to their durability issues, extra light fusion engines. Next, it needed to have enough weight saved for it still to be able to mount its main gun. Worst of all, the Hollander would need some degree of maneuverability and speed in order to achieve its mission goals. A compromise was made by giving the battle mech a 7-ton Omni 175 Fusion Standard engine, which gives it a maximum speed of 86 kilometers per hour, or 8 movement points in the tabletop game. During the Succession Wars, for a mech with this kind of role, this kind of movement would have been acceptable. Not good, perhaps leaning towards mediocre, it would have been something which would have not condemned the Hollander to too much criticism. During the Klein Invasion, which had much more intense battles using significantly more advanced technologies, this kind of movement could be a problem, especially since it's one of the only true defenses the Hollander has. But truth be told, its 86 kilometers movement isn't the end of the world. If the mech is used wisely, redeploys and avoids battles of maneuver, it will be an extremely effective, cheaper asset to bludgeon its intended targets to death with. Normally, in this part of the video, I have a graphic which says offensive systems, implying that there is more than one system on board. The Hollander, of course, kind of flips this around. Even some prior, heavily weighted into one weapon system's battle mechs, have at least small lasers, or a few medium lasers to back them up. This is not the case with the Hollander. This mech is wholly built to accommodate its main gun. And that's all. Mounted in the right torso, the Hollander has a Poland main Model A Gauss rifle with 2 tons of ammunition, yielding it 16 rounds of continuous fire. The gun itself weighs, as mentioned prior, 15 tons. A benefit of this giant cannon, at least, is that it produces little heat. Even the BZK standard heat sinks simply absorb it without any problem, unless the Hollander's engine has been critically hit. Twice. So, what makes this gun so desirable on the chassis? Prepare yourself for the obvious answer, but it must be told. First, it has an enormous range of 22 hexes. This means that only two main systems can escape its engagement distance, which are the AC2 autocannon family and the Clan ER Large Laser. To add to this, it does the absolutely fantastic and lethal volume of 15 points of damage in-game. This means that not only can it punch holes in targets, especially the light and medium mechs it was meant to help take down, it also has a chance, against any target on the battlefield, to instantly headcap and destroy an enemy mech. In other words, any Gauss rifle on the battlefield is a maximum threat to any battle mech. This means despite investing wholly in its Model A Gauss rifle, this battle mech will always have a presence on the battlefield until that gun is knocked out, or the mech is completely destroyed. Speaking of which, if the rifle, while active, is critically hit, it will instantly destroy the Hollander. Another limiting factor which the Hollander faces is in the realm of defense. 
While originally intended to have six tons of ferrofibrous plating, as stated before, this interfered with the mech's mobility and its gun, resulting in it being drawn down. The conclusion to that decision, however, is that the Hollander has four tons of ferrofibrous plating, giving it 72 points of protection overall. This means that its armor is very, very limited, meaning even a hit from a single PPC bolt in the side torso can penetrate and strike internally. While four tons isn't the end of the world for most mechs in this weight category, they typically have speed backing it up. The Hollander, while not an urban mech in terms of speed, is not fast, especially when put up against some of its clan peers. In short, the Hollander isn't fast enough to consistently avoid being hit, though it can generate some defensive bonuses if it is trapped in the open, and it is too little protected to take hits consistently. It doesn't have an XL engine at least, which does make it more durable, but if its Gauss rifle is critically hit, the mech will be destroyed, as there was no tonnage left to install a case for it. The Hollander is a fascinating addition to Battletech, and in particular to the Leering Commonwealth, and many mercenary forces. The Gauss Rifle must always be respected, and while the rest of the mech may lack in speed to some extent, and may be limited in its protection, it has the ammunition and range to frankly stay at longer engagement distances and deliver horrifying destruction from afar. This mobile, heavy cannon, which is in essence what the Hollander is at its core, fulfilled a necessary role for the armed forces of the Federated Commonwealth, and later the restored Leering Commonwealth armed forces, as well as the mercenaries across the board who were engaging in active conflicts with clan forces. What a surprise it must have been for Clan Jade Falcon in particular when these innovative designs began to appear on the field, firing on targets from afar as other light mechs screened them and pulled targets away. What a disaster it must have been for some as they watched their commanding officers and Starmate's battle mechs be decapitated by a flash of magnetic fire and a blur of silver. Despite the very clear weaknesses, the BZK-F3 Hollander, when deployed doctrinally, is one of the most effective weapons of war produced by the Inner Sphere in the later portions of the clan invasion, through to the Fedcom Civil War. Even in the Dark Age, these 35-ton Death Dealers would be very effective when deployed smartly. Often, the opposition simply will never know what destroyed them until it's too late. But the story of the Hollander doesn't end with its base form, as there would be evolutions of this design, even if they are perhaps flawed evolutions of it, in terms of the original 35-ton chassis. Many mech warriors would find the limiting role of the F3 Hollander too much to handle, having no backup weaponry to speak of on a light mech, in the potentially chaotic engagements they might find themselves in. And as a result, they gave the F3 a mixed reputation depending on the behavior of their commanders. The BZK-G1 was built as an attempt to bridge the gap between the original idea of the Hollander and the concerns of these pilots. First, the Gauss rifle is removed in favor of an LB-10X autocannon, and the spare weight is immediately put to work. Two medium lasers are installed to attempt to guard the mech more readily in close, and then its plating is upped to six tons, where it was originally meant to be, yielding 107 points of defense. While this is a popular model, in my opinion it's just not as capable as the original in fulfilling its mission goal. The extra plating is helpful, but it's there because the mech now has a shorter range, and may be committed to a more upfront engagement. If fighting clan mechs, it will still not be very long-lived, at least in my opinion. Next, its autocannon, while powerful, has the aforementioned shorter range, as well as the fact that it just hits with a smaller impact. While yes, 10 points of solid damage or 10 points of cluster can be helpful, it's not entirely as decisive as eliminating a target in potentially one hit, or plunging into the internal structure of an enemy light mech in a single round, in a crippling blow. It takes away the F3's greatest strength, in an attempt to shore up its weaknesses, which makes the G1 a half measure. It is most certainly still a dangerous mech, and LB-10X autocannon must be respected, but it is not feared in the same way as a Gauss rifle. 
the G1 would be introduced in 3056. Mentioned in the back of Technical Readout 3150, the Hollander BZK-G2 is another, newer take on the original, this time emerging during the Dark Age. At this time, it has no official record sheet that I'm aware of, nor does it have any entry on the master unit list. However, we do know that this variant exists, and is primarily armed with a light gauss rifle as well as a supercharger. Without having its full cannon rule set, at least that I've been able to find as mentioned before, it's simply hard to determine the full use of this machine. I will, however, be so bold as to say that this variant once again lacks the direct killing power of the gauss rifle, but trades it apparently for more range and speed, making it likely a better harasser than any prior model. This can't be confirmed as of this time, however. The Hollander was an exceptionally successful design, so much so that there would be two successors to it, which attempt to fix the issues of the original chassis in order to better fulfill its roles, albeit at a higher tonnage or cost. These mechs are their own entities, their own beasts, as it were, and will be covered later by their own mech videos but it would be almost criminal to not mention that they do indeed exist, and they bring an updated take to the Hollander as a whole. The Hollander 2 weighs in at 45 tons to attempt to hide some of the original's problems, while the Hollander 3, which weighs 35 tons and is a product of the Dark Age, uses substantially more sophisticated and expensive internal systems. I look forward to covering these machines at a later date. The Hollander is one of the most successful Battlemech designs to emerge from Technical Readout 3055. Not only is it a noteworthy design amongst the Battletech community at large, its footprint in-universe is enormous. The Hollander is a machine that helped to even the scales against the clan invasion, when employed smartly and wisely by its commanders, making it a threat to not only light mechs, but heavies and assaults as well and is one of the more dedicated designs laying into where the Inner Sphere had near parity in order to create one of the first true clan busters. But this design was good at destroying things beyond just its clan counterparts. People from the Great Houses and the Periphery would find the Hollander deployed as ambush predators, mobile snipers, and direct fire support mechs across the Inner Sphere as mercenary units would proliferate these from combat zone to combat zone. While it has successors, which are capable in their own right, the truth is the original Hollander, beyond its charm, is still an ever-deadly adversary on almost any battlefield. Those who don't believe it are putting their fate in the Hollander pilot's hands, especially as they line up the shot that just might be their end. Thank you all for joining me here today. A big shout out to Peter for prompting this video and allowing it to be possible in the dying hours of the Mercenaries Kickstarter. It was a fun ride in the final stream, and taking the suggestion on was an absolute blast. But wait, there's more! Another huge shout out also goes to Alan Blackwell, who is an incredible artist who made the fan art piece I'm using in the thumbnail and throughout the video. He is now on contract, if I'm not mistaken, with Catalyst Game Labs, and produces many of the new visual designs you may see. His interpretation of the original Hollander, in my opinion, is my favorite rendition of this mech ever. A huge facelift, in my opinion, over the original, all while making it seem more plausible. Thank you, Alan, for making this part of the video possible. Also, you'll note in this video I have used a track from Timothy Seal's remaster and remix of the Mech Warrior soundtrack. He's an incredible creator and I recommend checking out his channel. A link to his channel will be in the description below. After this video, we're finally returning to the Clan Mechs of 3050, with the next video planned for the channel being the Ever Dangerous Mistlinks, or Koshi. But with all of that said, if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking said video and subscribing to the channel. I do a lot of content like this, and you'll be happy with it, I think. Also, if you want to take that extra step in supporting what I do here, 
there is a YouTube membership program. Those who take the extra step and hit the join button to become members, I can't thank enough because it allows this channel to operate the way it does. This content is really made only possible because of viewers like you. And with that now out of the way, I look forward to seeing all of you in the comments section below.